Hey everyone, it's Evan Newfield here. I have some exciting news to share with you today. For the first time in over three years, I'm opening up space to take on new clients for investment management. If you've been waiting for the right opportunity to get professional financial planning and investment advice, now is your chance. I currently work with around 100 households managing over $55 million in assets across BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. So if you live in any of those provinces, I'll be doing new client onboarding in June and July, and I'm looking to add a few more households to my client group. If you're thinking about leaving your local bank branch for more personalized and transparent financial planning and investment advice, I'd love to hear from you. My investing approach is low cost, globally diversified and evidence based using factor tilted index funds from dimensional fund advisors. So if any of this sounds interesting to you, click on the link in the show notes below to join the waitlist by answering a few quick questions so I know a little bit more about your situation. And then you'll be able to see on that landing page the types of clients that are best suited for my area of expertise. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope to connect with some of you very soon. Thanks so much. Hello and welcome back to the Canadian Money Roadmap Podcast. I'm your host, Evan Neufeld. Today's episode is full of your questions. You sent them in and they cover the full gamut of capital gains, CPP, how to invest short-term and long-term money, how to invest for your kids using our ESPs, moving money out of a pension. We've got everything here in this episode. I'm going to try to do it as rapid fire as I can, but we're going to cover a lot of ground. Thank you so much for sending in your questions and we'll get right to it today on the Canadian Money Roadmap Podcast. Thanks again for all of you who have sent in your questions. As I mentioned on a previous episode, I can't answer all of them on the podcast. I got so many of them, uh, but I selected a few. The ones that I didn't select, just so there's no hurt feelings or anything like that. Sometimes they're too specific without any meaningful details. So it's a lot of, it depends, it depends, it depends. And so some of them would be better answered in the context of a personal engagement with a financial planner or with a lawyer or an accountant. Sometimes it wouldn't be applicable. Sometimes it's just out of my scope. And so the ones that I picked today were hopefully going to be valuable for as many people as possible. And the questions were general enough that I could give a pretty decent answer here on the podcast. But anyways, thanks to all of you who submitted your questions. And I hope to do this again some other time in the future. First one, This comes from John in Ottawa. He says, thanks for your wonderful podcast. Your knowledge has given me the confidence that I can make my financial decisions better. Awesome. That's the whole point of the podcast. I'm glad that resonated with you, John. Thanks for listening. He says, one thing that is still bothering me is related to capital gains. Take, for example, if I bought a townhouse 10 years ago at $200,000 and I sold it today for $400,000, how much taxes do I have to pay as capital gains? Okay, few things here. First, is this your principal residence? Meaning, do you actually live in the house or do you rent it out? So is it something that is earning income for you or is it um, a, a secondary property or like a vacation home or something like that? If it's your principal residence, there won't be capital gains tax at all. So maybe that answers your question right there. But if it is a rental or a secondary property and you can only claim one of your properties as your principal residence at any time, you do that when you sell one of the properties. So when you file your taxes and you have sold a property in that year, you have to designate it as your principal residence or not. And so if you do, when you sell one of those properties, that means that any other property you owned at that time would not be your principal residence. And as such, the gain that would have occurred during that same ownership period of time would be applicable for capital gains tax. But let's just make it simple here. Let's say this is a rental. So just like straight up, this was not something that you lived in and uh, say you're going to sell it. The rules for capital gains have changed very, very, very recently. And it's not even law yet, but it's proposed to be applicable on gains over $250,000. John, in your example here, you said you bought it for two hundred, sold it for four hundred. So we're not going to be in the new rules territory. So let's just stay with the existing rules as they are by the letter of the law today, and the dollar amounts for easy math. So there is something called the inclusion rate when it comes to capital gains, and that is the portion of the gain that is included. So inclusion rate included in your income. The inclusion rate is currently fifty percent. So in this case. Bought it for 200, sold it for 400. That means there's a gain of 200. So the inclusion rate is 
So in this case, there is a total gain of 200, but 50% of it is included in your taxable income. So in this case, $100,000 is included in your income in that year. Say you're still working. Say you've got $80,000 of employment income plus your $100,000 of taxable capital gain. That means your total income is $180,000 for the year. And so whatever province you're in determines how much tax you actually pay on that. So I can't give you an exact dollar amount for what you would actually owe in taxes because it's all included in your income. And the more money you make, the more tax you pay. And we've got our progressive graduated tax system where if you make money over a certain threshold, that money above the threshold is taxed at the new higher rate. This is the idea of tax brackets and things like that. I've talked about it a few times on the podcast if you want to dig through old episodes to figure out what that means. But I think the thing that we're getting hung up on here largely is just the inclusion rate. So in this uh, hypothetical, again, bought it for 200 sold it for 400 That means you have a total gain of 200, 50% is currently the inclusion rate. So $100,000 would be included in your income in addition to all the other sources of income you have and you'd pay taxes at your normal rate. Question number two is about CPP. Does CPP get taxed every month when you receive it or at the end of the year? And this comes from Thunder Bay, no name on this one. Okay, broad strokes, as far as taxation goes, everything is taxed at the end of the year, kind of conceptually. That is the day of reckoning, like when you actually file your taxes. This is where everything has to be accounted for. But what often happens is with different sources of income, there's something called withholding tax, means you have to prepay taxes before you receive the money. You still have to account for that at the end of the year because sometimes withholding tax is too much, sometimes it's not enough, and that's why you get refunds or that's why you owe money at the end of the year. And so with CPP... It is all taxable income. So again, the, the day of reckoning is is when you file at the in, in spring of the following year, just like you would with any of your other income. But as far as withholding taxes, meaning do you have to prepay any taxes on it? No, you don't have to prepay any of your taxes on CPP. Most people will find themselves in a pretty ugly situation, though, if they don't. And if you have not prepared for that, that is not very fun to get a surprise tax bill at the end of the year. So you can choose to have taxes withheld from your CPP payments before you receive it. Many people decide to do that, but it's not required. So it is all taxable. It's all taxable income at the end of the year when you receive all of your slips. However, if you would like to prepay some of those taxes so you don't have to save for it yourself, you can choose to do that. Question number three. Hi, Evan. I've been enjoying listening to your show. You have a great voice and great content. (laughs) Thank you very much. Uh, A few questions. I just got a settlement from a car accident. So I have around $160,000 to invest as well as another sixty dollars I've already saved. I'd like to use some of that money to go to school. The rest would either go to a down payment one day or towards retirement. So some of the money would be used in a few months. Some would likely be used in a few years and the rest would be for the long term. Given these different periods of times I'm working with, how do I choose what kind of risk to take when investing? Should I have short-term money set aside? And this listener gives a few more specifics about theoretical options here, but I'm just going to hop into my answer. When it comes to determining whether you should be investing or saving, if there's a known timeline and typically, you know, three years or less, you know, short-term money and a known amount required. So you probably have a good idea how much you need for school. You probably have a good idea how much you need for a down payment. You, collective you as listeners, should be more concerned about downside than upside, meaning you want to avoid investment risk. The bet has been made on what these things cost and what your capacity is to to acquire money to, to meet that need. So if you make anything On the cash you've set aside for these short-term things, it's a bonus. This is not the time to add risk with the goal of, of trying to make a pile of money on it. I hear tons and tons and tons of people say, I don't want my money to just sit there. Yes, you do. (laughs) Yes, yes, you do. You want your money to sit there and it will just sit there. And that's good because then there'll be no surprises when it comes to pulling the money out for the down payment, for paying for school, for things like that. If you try to be smarter and say like, oh, well, I have a high risk tolerance, I'm going to invest my money. And then the perfect house comes around and you are ready to go and you need to move out of your basement suite and you want to buy your house and the market just happens to be down 20% in a month and now you don't have enough money to buy the house that you want. Now what? 
Now what are you going to do? Don't ask me how I know this. <laughs> Okay. I see all sorts of things. I've made some mistakes myself in the past with being over-risked on short-term money. You don't want to do this. So short-term things, known timeline things, known cost things, you don't want to be invested in the markets. Stocks, bonds, that's not for you. For goals that are far off in the future with indefinite amounts needed and indefinite timelines, so like retirement, it's like, well, I'm going to retire at 65. Yeah, but you need to have the money pay for the rest of your life as well. And you don't know how long you're going to live. So retirement is kind of an indefinite timeline that you're dealing with there too. So this is where the upside potential of investing comes in, into play. So I don't know the listener and I don't know their situation. So I'm not going to give specific recommendations of combinations of stocks and bonds because that's based on how many years that might be, how much they have saved, what kind of things they've done in the past when the stock market has declined. You know, there's, there's, objective and subjective reasons for having stocks and bonds in the portfolio. But in general, this is where equities, meaning stocks, would enter the conversation for a long-term investor because this is where you want to start seeing some growth. So I kind of like to separate these things between known timelines, known amounts, and indefinite timelines, indefinite amounts. And this is where you kind of have that separation of long-term risk profile. That's where you kind of invest that indefinite amounts, indefinite timeline money. And known amounts, known timeline, this is where I say risk is out of the question and you probably don't want to have any of it. Cool thing is right now, the, the yields that you can get on most cash savings accounts or money market funds or things like that are higher than the most recent inflation rates. This is very rare where the actual rate that you can get on cash is higher than inflation. Doesn't happen, hasn't happened for a very long time. So broadly speaking, you can currently maintain your purchasing power if you know how much you need by saving it uh, in a cash-like vehicle, like a high-interest savings account. All depends on your bank or the financial institution you work with. But anyways, that's what I would recommend here. Question number four. Hey, Evan, my name is Brandon from Yorkton, Saskatchewan. Hey, someone relatively local to me. I've been listening to your podcast for years, but I've only recently been trying to put financial health more to the forefront. My two questions are, number one, how can I set up custodial investment accounts for my kids and what should I look for an advisor when the local options are very limited? Keep creating great Canadian content. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. Now, the question number one, how, do, how can I set up custodial investment accounts for my kids? I would say don't. <laughs> um, th there are so many pitfalls when it comes to setting up these types of accounts that can mostly be avoided by just keeping the money in your name and giving them gifts when you want to or using an RESP. And our ESP is the cleanest, simplest way to invest money on behalf of your kids and keep the tax problems in their name. A lot of people set up in trust for accounts. These are kind of informal trusts that you can, in theory, set up at a bank. This is probably the same language that you're using of custodial investment accounts. To do it properly and to follow CRA's letter of the law on actual income and investment income attribution rules and whether something can be deemed to be a trust in the first place, it requires third parties and it, it, it requires way more tracking and general investing know-how than most people have. I always steer people away from doing it because it is not worth it. If you're investing more than the lifetime maximum of an RESP, like $50,000 for a child, you should be dealing with a lawyer to set up trust anyways or just keep the money for yourself. But largely speaking, I would just say, do it with an RESP or don't bother doing it. There are 101 ways to do it incorrectly and all of them work until they don't. And, and you probably don't want to be in a situation where you want to be bumping up against CRA on these kind of things. So that's just my general recommendation. If you want to set up, invest some money for your kids, I would do it in the context of an RESP or just keep the money for yourself, pay the taxes on it yourself. Or if you have TFSA room yourself, just park it in your own TFSA and, and give it to them when they turn 18. Hopefully that wasn't too blunt of an answer there, but it's it's just not something I would advise people do. His second question here is, what should I look for in an advisor when the local options are very limited? I had an episode on this a while back where I talked about a whole pile of things that you can ask a potential advisor, but if you're not wanting to work with someone in your local area, the vast majority of advisors that I'm familiar with that are reasonably tech savvy, 
can work with you on a virtual basis, and that is no problem. So, for example, I have clients in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario. So I've got clients pretty well across the western part of the country, including Ontario, and we operate virtually. We do digital signatures. I've got clients who are in their 90s in other provinces and ones that are young, kind of all over the place. So if you're comfortable with that, you can kind of expand your search for an advisor beyond just your local area. And you can ask them, say, are you willing to work with someone virtually and someone outside of your community? And many of us, I say, would be without bogging down the episode with with all of the different things that I would recommend you look for in an advisor in general. I will just link that old episode in the show notes here and you can have a listen to that one. CFP credentials are a good one to to start with and you can find CFPs in your area or your province or wherever you want to deal with somebody through FP Canada. So that's Financial Planning Canada. Go over to FP Canada's website and you can click on their homepage. I think it says find a planner, something like that. And there are tons of different filtering criteria that you can look for if you're some needing someone that works with a specific type of person or a circumstance. Generally, we're able to add that to our profile to make sure that it is findable for other people. So that could be a good place to start. But again, take a look in the show notes of this episode to find that that previous episode about all the different questions that you could ask a potential new advisor. Okay, question number five. Would you advise moving your pension pot from a previous employer and investing into an ETF under a lira? Short question, lots to unpack here. So there's two different types of pensions that you could have. One is called a defined benefit pension, and that type of pension pays you a set amount of money for the rest of your life. And a defined contribution pension is likely what this person is talking about. It is just a pool of money that you can start withdrawing from at some point in the future and you just have to make it work. Once the money is gone, the pension is gone. It's not a traditional pension in the way that the vast majority of people would actually think about it. That would be a defined benefit pension where the money just keeps showing up as long as you're alive. That type of pension, if you leave at a certain amount, all depends on the pension. There's so many details here, but in theory, there is an option for you to do something called commuting your pension where they would provide you a lump sum dollar amount instead of providing you money for the rest of your life. And this is highly, highly, highly situational. And before I keep going here, if you can hear a lawnmower, please forgive me. I started recording at the wrong time. There's a, someone's mowing the lawn right outside our window, which almost never happens. So anyways, forgive me for the background noise. Determining whether you should commute your pension or not is very highly situational. And so I I don't feel comfortable speaking to that necessarily, but if you have a defined contribution pension where the money is just yours anyways and you're not trading guarantees versus to non-guarantees and that kind of thing, it's it's just invested money somewhere else to invested money somewhere else. Generally speaking, most of the clients that I deal with don't want to have bits and bobs of money all over the place and you're dealing with, say, an insurance company who manages the pension at your previous employer but you invest your own money yourself or you might deal with the bank or you might deal with an advisor or something like that. And then when the time comes to start taking your money out, you have no cohesive plan. There's no strategy and none of the people involved with either of those on the back end are able to communicate with each other. And it's a mess. Pick one lane and stick with that. So if you want to work with an advisor, fantastic. You'll be able to amalgamate everything in one place using a lira instead of keeping it at the previous employer. There's almost no situation that I would recommend you keep the money with the previous employer through your retirement years. They're going to charge you some ongoing service fees for it, but there's very little to zero service being offered. If you didn't want to be a DIY investor, which in my opinion, the vast majority of people probably don't have the time, talent, or temperament to be DIY investors. But if if, if that's you and you don't want to be DIY, I would recommend finding an advisor that you feel comfortable with and investing with them because yes, they're going to charge a service fee as well, but at least you're going to get service with, with a good advisor that provides a a reasonable level of service there. Cool thing is you can shop it around um, and find someone that you like and is a good fit for your personality and your situation and all that kind of stuff. But as far as investing in ETFs specifically, sure, that would be fine. Some ETFs are great. Some of them are terrible and don't 
meet your need at all. Some mutual funds are great. Some mutual funds are terrible. The structure of the product does not define the validity of it for you in general. Some ETFs are great. Some mutual funds are great. But without a core investment philosophy or style or what you're trying to accomplish, you don't know whether a mutual fund or an ETF or individual securities are the best option for you. And so giving a recommendation on a specific product wouldn't be appropriate in this case because I don't know who this person is. So again, back to the question, would you advise moving your pension pot from a previous employer and investing under a lira? Generally speaking, for simplicity's sake, I like to keep things all under one roof. If you're already a comfortable DIY investor, move it to the platform of your choice and just manage it alongside the other money that you're already doing. If this is your first time you're investing and you're unsure of what to do, just leave it there. That's fine. And you can figure it out later. But if you work with an advisor that you're comfortable with, I'd recommend moving it over to to them to keep everything all under one roof for simplicity's sake, for future income's sake, for all of your financial planning purposes. Having things in different places is not diversification. It is confusion. So to answer the question, uh, I would say probably, (laughs) but without knowing more of your circumstance, I can't give you a specific answer. Number six, this question came from Spotify. I've got a little question box on Spotify. So if you're a Spotify listener, you can keep an eye out for that and submit some questions there too. I have reached the point where I no longer get the CESG or the learning bond. These are government grants for our ESP accounts. Should I continue to make contributions of $2,500 yearly? Should I look to invest the money for my child in other ways? So it kind of goes back to my other question. If you're investing money specifically for your kids, our ESPs are pretty well the only tool that are clean and simple for you and I, like everyday people, to, to actually do that cleanly. But in a case where you no longer get those, that means the child is probably over the age of 14 and you've already maximized the, the grant money. So the, the only little tidbit that I'll add here is the 2500 bucks is just the amount that you would contribute on an annual basis to maximize the CESG, Canadian Education Savings Grant, I think that's the acronym. So the 2500 per year is not the maximum that you can put into in RESP, there's a lifetime maximum of total contributions. There's a lifetime maximum of CESG that you can receive. Most people that try to get a good amount into an RESP for their kids are doing that 2500 bucks a year to maximize the CESG, but you can invest up to $50,000 into an RESP per child, even though a good chunk of that money will not attract grant. So if you're at the situation where you can't get grant from one reason or another anyways, but you want to invest some more money for your kids, don't bother with the $2,500 artificial maximum. You can put pretty well whatever you want in there up to the lifetime max of 50000 per child. So if you want to invest for the kids, I would say keep going. Yep. Okay, the last question here is... Uh, related more to my role as a CFP and a CFP who also does investment management on behalf of clients. And so the question came from someone in Kelowna. And because it is a little bit more niche and a little bit more around me, I considering doing this as a bonus episode or something different entirely. Um, so I'm just going to put it out to you as the broad audience. If you would like to hear me talk about my career path and the structure of an independent firm versus, um, say, a planner at the bank and how I would compare and contrast those roles and how I got into the business and uh, all those sorts of things, if you're interested in that, shoot me a text at the the text line. So at the top of the, the description of this episode, it'll say, send Evan a text message. Shoot me a text and let me know if this would be interesting for you. If I get a couple people that say yes, I'll just do an episode on this sometime in the future specifically so I can spend enough time to get into it a little bit more. But anyways, thank you so much for all of you who submitted all of your questions. Hopefully this type of episode is valuable for you. In the next little while, I'm going to start doing more episodes geared towards retirement specifically and uh, planning for retirement. So you can be on the lookout for that kind of thing. If you are someone that was looking to submit questions and you're kind of in that five to 10 year window of retirement and you've you've got some questions in that regard, I'd love to do a Q&A specifically about retirement planning going forward. But I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for listening to this episode and we will catch you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Canadian Money Roadmap Podcast. 
Any rates of return or investments discussed are historical or hypothetical and are intended to be used for educational purposes only. You should always consult with your financial, legal, and tax advisors before making changes to your financial plan. Evan Neufeld is a certified financial planner and registered investment fund advisor. Mutual funds and ETFs are provided by Sterling Mutuals, Inc.